Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Anik Glode, and I'm the curator of the Varley Art Gallery of Markham in Ontario, Canada. First, while we're all connecting from our various locations in the real world, across Canada, across the United States, we have people from uh, Europe, from Vietnam, Bahrain, Norway, the Philippines, Australia joining us today. Um, thank you for that. I would still like to acknowledge that the Varley Art Gallery is situated on the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. We also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on this land, and in particular, the First Nations community in closest proximity to us in York Region, the Chippewas of Georgina Island. For us, this statement means that the gallery is committed to truth, to learning the history of this land by doing our own research, by listening, and by collaborating. Online is the joint initiative between Markham Public Art and the Varley Art Gallery of Markham. It delves into the, poten the potential of public art production and social engagement in the digital sphere. Driving it is the central question. Can this time of uncertainty be productive? Can it be an opportunity for us to pause and reflect, to reshape and imagine new public spatial relationships? whether built or natural, virtual or physical. Arising directly from the City Council approved Markham Public Art Master Plan 2020-2024, online explores the multiple factors that steer the making of public art, how artworks find their sites and become public. Unfolding over the summer of 2020, online has two parts, a practical webinar series on public art titled Homework, which is co-produced with public art consulting firm, Art Plus Public Unlimited, and an online competition for speculative public art proposal titled Delimit. The entire initiative is hosted on and distributed by a publicly available networks of digital platforms. On behalf of the Varley Art Gallery, I would like to thank the Ontario Arts Council and the Varley Mackay Art Foundation of Markham for their ongoing support. I'll pass it along to Yan, who will introduce today's session. Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Yan Wu, the public art curator at the city of Markham. And uh, thanks, Nick. Um, welcome online. Thank you all for coming. I really wish uh, I can see your face. And in the physical room situation, now it's about time for us to make eye contact. As mentioned by Anik, we have prepared a summer long online program on public art for you all to participate whether you consider yourself as the maker or the viewer or the producer. The reason behind choosing this platform is obviously COVID related. Um, when Markham City Council formally approved the public art master plan as Nick mentioned earlier and a related implementation plan, I was planning a three day international public art summit for June. Actually, it was supposed to happen a week ago. Um, with public art consultant Rebecca Carbon, who is also one of the producers behind today's homework. Thank you, Rebecca, for being part of this. It has been a great pleasure working with you. A few weeks later, COVID-19 happened. And like everything else and everyone else, we had to postpone the summit to the fall and explore ways to move it online. Today's event is part of this ongoing exploration. Please send us your feedback after the events and let us know how to improve what works, what doesn't, what is missing. Help us to get ready for the larger summit in the fall. I believe we all have learned a lot about public space during this special time, the power of it, whether in virtual or in physical, what it means to be part of this space as a participating individual, as an agency. There is still a lot to learn and the role of public art is definitely part of this learning curve. Back to today's program, homework. It is a webinar series that is designed, um, designed to explore the practical knowledge needed to conceptualize and to produce public art project while focusing specifically on three themes, forms of rendering, proposal design, and the materiality and the fabrication. I do want to add one note here that our idea of being practical in this case does not mean we try to run a vocational school that is to teach technical skills. What we are interested in is to provide a platform for knowledge exchange and production that is rooted in practice, but charged with critical awareness and imagination. 
a variety of professionals working in the discipline will, con will contribute their voices throughout the week. We had a wonderful session on rendering on Monday, another exciting one upcoming on Friday. The register link, registration link can be found in the chat box. Today's topic is proposal design. I guess it's a million dollar question and everybody wants to know the answer. Is it concept, scale, material, or the ability to manage a budget? How do artists unify studio practice and a site-specific response and address the community? Understanding how to do it personally, I also hope, will enable the agency of artists becoming the interface leading us toward systematic changes in this field. In this webinar, and uh, Chloe Catan, public art manager at Waterfront Toronto, and David Turbo, Turnbull, director of public art and the conservation at Edmonton Arts Council, will share insights on how to design a convincing public art proposal and the landscape of current and future public art opportunities. Just a quick note, if you have any questions during the presentations, please submit them to the Q&A box. That will be a dedicated Q&A period in today's session. Appreciate your patience. Now, with great pleasure, I'm going to introduce today's moderator, Crystal Mori. Crystal Mori is senior curator at the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery. Her work often explores the tension between perceived authenticity and a troubled form of representation. Her curatorial projects include numerous solo exhibitions and a group exhibitions such as The Limits in 2011, Imitation of Life in 2015, The Brain is Wider Than the Sky in 2018, and I Will Be on Marrying in 2018. Her solo projects with Ontario-based art artists Maggie Grote and Ernest Dateweiler has received Exhibition of the Year awards from the Ontario Association of Art Galleries. In 1913, she co-curated Romancing the Anthropocene, a group exhibition situated in Toronto's financial district for Nuit Blanche. Now, and uh, let me switch the camera and uh, welcome Crystal. Just give me a second. And uh, I should stop that and I should leave. Just give me a quick second. Okay, here you go. Okay. Thank you, Yan. Um, I'm delighted to be invited to participate in this conversation today. I am coming to you all from my office at the Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery. And the gallery is situated in an area known locally as the Civic District. As its name suggests, the district is a space in which multiple facets of civic life converge. It includes a mix of residential dwellings, the municipal library's main branch, the regional police headquarters, and government buildings. At the center of this district is a parquet, which houses a playground, a memorial to fallen firefighters, and a single beam salvaged from the rubble left at the site of the World Trade Towers in New York. While the specific rationale for this form of public art remains unclear, and far from holistic, the result is an alien presence in a space which previously served as a civic self, with imagery and an aesthetic that seems deeply rooted in a European tradition of memorial statuary. One can't help but ponder how this speaks to those who live in the present, let alone those who will come in the future. We are in an exciting moment though, um, so I don't wanna to dwell too much on you know, that particular situation. But I believe this is a moment when we are thinking carefully about the histories of statues, of the space occupied by outdated imagery, and the distillation of power within civic space. It's a time when we are being encouraged to imagine alternate lifestyles for the art that lives in our shared spaces. The primary conditions for public art haven't changed though. We are still concerned about weather and elements and the management of financial resources. But maybe our expectations for the role that art plays in public light has changed. My hope is that we might be able to dig down a little further into that subject during today's webinar. Today we're honored to have both guest presenters who will share their insights 
on what makes a successful proposal for public artwork. Both of our presenters will share brief slide presentations, which will offer us an introduction to the unique context in which their experience is rooted. These presentations will be followed by a discussion in which we will reflect on themes such as making the transition from a studio to a public practice and making that evident in your proposal, the importance of knowing a site, how to balance subtlety and spectacle, and how we may and we may even engage in some speculation about what shifts may emerge in the near future as a result of the recent past that we've all shared. On that note, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Chloe Catan has managed public art commissions for Millennium Park in Chicago, the Vancouver Sculpture Biennial, Herman Park in Houston, and Michigan State University. Previously the acting public art curator for the city of Mississauga, Chloe currently runs the public art program for Waterfront Toronto. Please join me in welcoming Chloe Catan. Thanks, Crystal. Um, I will share my screen for everyone. I will um, do a quick presentation on Waterfront Toronto's um, public art program, and then I can hand it over back to, to Crystal. Um, there we go. Hopefully you can all see my screen. So Waterfront Toronto is the, um, is the tripartite government agency who, that, is, that is responsible for uh, revitalizing Toronto's waterfront. Um, we have a robust public art program that began in 2009. And since then, we've been building important collections in, in the neighborhoods that we're building. Um, you know, as we plan um, neighborhoods, we see public art as a, as a really integral component of the public realm. Right, so um, the Waterfront Toronto Public Art Program. The first step is, you know, when we uh, conceptualize uh, public art plans for each precinct, that is, you know, or neighborhood, um, you know, we, we, we sort of use, we use these sort of um, public art plans as a blueprint for projects as funding becomes available. Um, the first plan to be written was for the West Donlands neighborhood in Toronto. And you can see right here in the bottom hand uh, right corner, a, uh, a, the cover of, of, this, of this document. Um, it was written in 2011, um, and that was sort of the beginning of our public art program. So whenever an artist applies to an opportunity, it's really important for them to fam familiarize themselves with these documents, because it gives them a context for the project um, and how it fits in with the larger plan for the neighborhood and perhaps some overarching themes for art that, uh, that we've been thinking of. Here are some artworks that are currently installed in that neighborhood. Uh, my colleague Rebecca Carbon, who is, is here with us today, did a great job of managing most of these projects before I came along. Um, in Clockwork, this is Water Guardians by Jennifer Marmon and Daniel Borens on Front Street. Um, next, going clockwise, is um, Untitled or Lamp Posts by Tadashi Kawamata, also on Front Street. We have Mirage by Paul Raff and Underpass Park. Um, and then down here, Garden of Future Follies by Hadley and Maxwell, also on Front Street. Uh, Peeled Pavement by Jill Anholt on Mill Street. And this one down here in the middle um, is No Shoes by Mark DeSovero, which was already owned by the city, um, but was in storage. Um, and it was restored and installed in Corktown Common. And then here, down here on the left, is site specific by Scott Yunsen and Marion Loving um, at Schumach and Eastern. Um, you know, as soon as these, these uh, artworks are installed, we transfer, actually, let me go back to this one again, because I want to talk about West Donlands a little bit more. Um, as soon as these artworks are, are, are installed, we transfer them to the city of Toronto and they become part of the municipal collection. Um, and then coming up, you know, for West Donlands, we have two really exciting projects at, at the King Queen River Triangle and the future Anishinaabe Health Centre. Uh, we'll be working with an Indigenous curator to commission two important Indigenous artworks for these sites that are near the Don River. In East Bayfront, that's um, another precinct. Uh, we have two works already installed. On the left, this is Light Showers by Jill Anholt, um, which is part of the incredible kind of stormwater system at Sherburn Common North. Um, so it's very much integrated into, into the infrastructure of the neighbourhood. 
And then here on the, on the right, um, which is a new, the newest addition to Waterfront Toronto, it's um, Lightkeeper by Calgary-based artists uh, Caitlin Brown, Wayne Garrett, and Studio North. Um, this is a really beautiful artwork, um, and it has you know, a moon clock and rainbow projections that, that, sort of, that move across uh, the new Aitken Place Park. So what's next for East Bayfront? If you look at our public art master plan, um, a, a lot of these sort of small, middle, middle sort of smaller circles um, have artworks that have, that have already been implemented, some by the city's uh, percent for art program. And these, one, these large ones along the top will be artworks at uh, Jarvis, Sherborne and Parliament underpasses. But the one that we're focusing on now is called what we call the destination um, art piece, which is the largest commission that Waterfront Toronto has ever, has ever done. Um, right at the water's edge, um, you know, at, uh, at, at Sherburn Common. And, um, you know, this will be, you know, hopefully a really, really um, innovative, exciting piece that will examine the city's relationship uh, with the water. The RFQ, or the Request for Qualifications, which is the first stage of the call, um, is here on the right, the pink um, document. And that closed very recently. And uh, we'll have an, a, a jury um, soon, you know, convening to to sort of develop uh, to sort of um, to shortlist artists who will develop proposals for that particular call. So last year we launched um, a new temporary art program in order in order to further activate public spaces along the water's edge. Um, you know, people sort of know Waterfront Toronto as, uh, as, as sort of implementing large permanent pieces of public art, but, you know, we think it's really, really important to also, um, you know, activate the water's edge with really, really dynamic uh, pieces of, of temporary and ephemeral um, art, which can be, you know, very timely and, and powerful. It can move faster, obviously, than big permanent pieces, and so you can address issues that are that are very timely and, and, and important to communities. Um, you know, and it can foster a healthy public dialogue about art and community. And also, really importantly, it can open up opportunities for artists who haven't worked on large, um, you know, permanent public art pieces to get experience and expand their practice on, let's say, smaller um, pieces. Um, you know, uh, so, so what, what you see here is, is one uh, piece that we that we installed last year called SOS Safety Orange Swimmers um, by Anne Hirsch and Jeremy Angers, which talks to the refugees, um, you know, the, the, the global refugee crisis. Uh, this was installed right next to the ferry terminal in Harbour Square Park. Just quickly, some other um, temporary pieces that we've installed. And, uh, you know, on the left is, um, it's called flight, it was called Flight Mode, and this is a project uh, in shipping containers that we collaborated on with the South Asian Visual Arts Center in the car park uh, space under the Victory Silos. Um, this is underneath here on the left is a mural, uh, you know, uh, done by Under the Gardener uh, by Jackie Comrie, who uses color to address mental health. Um, and then here, up here in the middle, uh, we, we collaborated with uh, the, the business uh, improvement uh, the BIA um, and uh, to sort of to bring some of the water, so the, the winter stations down to the waterfront. Uh, it used to be called icebreakers, um, but you know, we had something called loop at York Street Park and those and the sort of seesaws um, at harbor front that some of you in Toronto might have seen. But really, before we formally um, had a temporary art program, you know, Waterfront Toronto was always uh, strove to commission artists and partner with the city to animate the waterfront with temporary installations, performances, and murals. So these images that you see up here um, on the right are, you know, and down here are murals and installations and performances that Waterfront Toronto had, you know, had, had already commissioned. So what's next uh, for our temporary art program? Um, on the left here is a really, really uh, exciting uh, project that we've been working on with Contact Photography Festival. This was supposed to go up um, in May, but you know, COVID uh, postponed things. But uh, what we're planning to put it up this summer, there'll be like uh, eight really large scale billboards um, along Villiers, uh, Villiers Street in the Portlands. 
um, that focus on that sort of show buildings that were that have been demolished or are soon to be demolished as part of the Portland's uh, flood protection uh, project. Um, so you know, keep a, an eye out for that. And then here on the right, this is um, something that's sort of really close to my heart. It is uh, a new artist residency that's just gone up. It's still the call is open. Um, this is a, a project that we're collaborating on with the uh, with the BIA, and um, it's a 16-month residency um, that's really focused on um, community-engaged art, um, and um, and you know we'll ask artists to 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 sort of really engage uh, with with the waterfront and its communities and projects that are happening down there, and you know and and then sort of roll out a series of projects in the year of public art um, in Toronto, that's, you know, next year, 2021. And finally, um, Waterfront Toronto tries to bring as many cultural events um, down to the waterfront as, as possible. So, you know, we'd like to see our shoreline as a, as a hub uh, for arts and culture, you know, a place that's full of activity and experimentation and creativity. Um, so last year, you know, the Toronto Biennial came down to the waterfront. And in past years, we've had Art Spin, Nuit Blanche, and Luminato at the Hearn host major events and venues on the waterfront in our public spaces. So we'll, we'll continue to partner with organizations and events um, sort of to bring as much cultural programming to the waterfront. And that's it for my presentation. Stop sharing. Over to you, Crystal. Okay, sorry, I'm just trying to see them there. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, it's wonderful to hear a little bit more about the priorities established by Waterfront Toronto, and I look forward to hearing a little more about that big project once it um, it's awarded and becomes public. Uh, I think we're going to move over to David now, and David's going to talk to us a little bit about what uh, what he's been up to. David Turnbull has been with the Edmonton Arts Council since 2009. He holds a Master of Art Conservation degree from Queen's University and a BFA from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. The most rewarding part of David's job is meeting artists and understanding the work they do while thinking about how artists can build communities and bring people together. Please join me for a presentation by David Turnbull. Hi, um, thanks. I think that was a that was fantastic, and I think that a lot of the things that that Chloe had to say um, also apply to some of the things that we're trying to do as well here in Edmonton. Um, so I'm just going to pull up my presentation here. So the the Edmonton Arts Council um, has been around for oh geez, I'm totally unprepared for this. 1996. Um, the Percent for Art pro policy with the city has been around since 1992, um, but the actual collection, um, public art collection or civic collection as we just call it for short, um, with the city has been around since at least the 1950s, uh, but never really formalized until about 2008. Um, so Edmonton Arts Council is a not-for-profit organization. Um, we are an arm's reach um, organization uh, that operates through a service agreement by the city of Edmonton. Um, you know, some of the, the things that we do and public art just fits in as one of these things is uh, the, the bulk of what we do is project grants for artists. We do travel grants, we do operating funds for um, art organizations and festivals. Um, we host artists in residence, we run poet laureate programs. Um, workshops and events. Uh, we also do public programming and then we also have a retail uh, ticket and sales uh, outlet as well. Um, you know the, the public art is by far the most visible thing and probably the most um, I think in most cities it's all it's the most political um, thing as well. Um, so in 2008 we had a, a public art master plan that was created um, in 2007 the public art policies were overhauled from their 1992 status. Um, and really it, it was to formalize what kinds of projects would, would apply for or would, would qualify for permanent public art projects in the city and what the funding mechanism was like. 
But in 2008, there was a uh, public art master plan that was created. And this really was an ambitious 10 year plan um, that went along with the current 10 year um, cultural plan of the city at the time called the Art of Living. And, you know, it, it really looked to kind of catalyze things from a, as far as public art goes within the city to, um, you know, create certain initiatives to really spark things off and start to place public art in a contemporary, in a more contemporary way within the city. Um, that completed in 2018. And, you know, as, as the time went along over those 10 years, some things were dropped, some things were funded and carried out through other, other organizations. Um, some things were up for reassessment and we just decided, well, they're not really relevant anymore. Um, in 2018, we began the next 10 year plan and this is what we call connections and exchanges. So this is the city's cultural plan um, to transform arts and heritage for the city of Edmonton. The big three ambitions as we kind of see as our North Star guiding light here is to create a city that's alive with arts and heritage, create a hub of extraordinary creation and reputation and create a thriving and well-funded arts and heritage ecosystem. Um, but in short, the mission is just to infuse arts and culture and heritage into every aspect of Edmonton's civic fabric um, and support those creatives um, and grow audiences. Um, so how we currently work is we, we carry out a series of policies on behalf of the city, the Percent for Art, um, with public art administration, conservation, reciting and geocession policies. Um, and we work through a service agreement through the city of Edmonton. So we are tax, uh, tax funded. Um, like most municipalities, um, at least in North America, you know, 1% of eligible qualifying uh, construction costs go towards new public artwork. Um, according to the policy, it is for permanent artwork. And so this really limits what we can do as far as temporary works or transitory works and more experimental works. Um, but because of the nature of the, the permanent nature of it, we do quite a bit of project support and working with artists and with the city. Um, we have a collections officer, we have a conservation officer, we have project officers that act as support for the artists as well. Um, conservation support is there as a resource for the artist, but it's also there as a resource for the organization and for the city themselves too. Um, because if we're looking at, you know, making something that's as permanent as possible, it really starts from that uh, early, early uh, conception phase of the ideas. Um, right now we manage a collection of over 250 permanent artworks. We've got anywhere from 30 to 35 uh, on the go at any given time. Um, and we have various methods for acquiring uh, public art. In the past, we would work through standard RFP and RFQ methods. Um, we've we've uh, put the RFP process on hold for a while for a number of reasons. One, because we wanted to make sure that artists were paid for their ideas. And two, because when artists were proposing ideas, we kind of questioned how relevant they actually were in a public art realm. Um, it, or within public art practice. And by that, I mean, does it, do they really have an opportunity to do research and respond to the site conditions and to the environment as well? Um, and when you are basically going through a, a, the selection committee and you're looking at the various proposals that artists are submitting, um, you know, there's a good chance that some of these artworks will not be realized for two, three, four, five years. So really how relevant are they by the time that they're created? So now we're going through an RFQ process where we um, have the artist shortlisted, uh, but then we go through an interview stage with the artist and then we support them through their concept development work and also provide them with support um, through curatorial support as well um, that is independent of us as the funders. Um, so we, we like that idea that we can actually support artists through their idea making because we know with a lot of artists that often will operate in a vacuum and it's, it's a very difficult way of working. These are just some very broad examples of some types of artworks that we have in the collection from indoor paintings to outdoor sculptures to cast iron monoliths to land art dating back to the 1970s, um, 1960s mosaics in a really harsh environment within a city like Edmonton. Um, we have some fairly monumental pieces as well. 
um, that, oh, sorry, my timer has just gone off because I wanted to make sure that I gave myself off time. Anyways, um, so fairly monumental works by some regional artists as well. Um, uh, other Canadian artists working in various media. Um, we do experiment quite a bit with various media in Edmonton, partly because it's a really harsh environment. Um, where we are a fairly young program as far as the formalization of the program goes. And um, from my point of view as a conservator, when I first came on in 2009, I was really interested in seeing how some of these modern materials fared in the environment. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that not only were we testing, but we were also trying to do it in a responsible way. Uh, we have some sound art, which we are currently dealing with, um, upgrades in technology. Um, Modern Plastics, this is an international artist group from, from Germany called Ingesi Day. Um, indoor Plastics uh, with local up and coming artists. Um, contentious pieces such as our Talus Dome, which was, uh, you know, every city has their piece um, that everyone hates um, or they, they love to hate or they grow to love it. Um, neon pieces. We have a 60 yard neon outdoor piece um, that we discovered uh, we shouldn't maybe not have done after we had a hailstorm right after it was installed. But at the same time, the trade off is that this is, uh, while it's risky, it's a very sublime and beautiful piece. We're always looking at ways that we can integrate artists within the design teams to maximize how much the artists can get paid for their work and also piggyback onto the construction project. So this is a rain screen facade design. And of course, um, you know, we, we were the host city or the final stop for the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission um, a number of years ago here in Edmonton. And you know, we, we really started looking at the collection and started looking at, okay, if, if we want to really start building our collection in an equitable way, that represents the citizens, represents the history of the place. Um, we really need to work much more closely with indigenous artists, change our practices, and then also do a curatorial assessment of our collection to actually look at what some of the inequities within the collection are. Um, not just from a diversity of background, but also a diversity of material and medium, because um, one of those things that you know, we're always restricted by is of course the permanence of things. We pride ourselves quite a bit on um, working with artists who have also had their first time working in a permanent public art realm. Um, sometimes these go off the rails, sometimes they turn out to be spectacular. Um, and you know, this is where I think our program is really strong in how we work with and support artists through the process. We're not here to micromanage, but we are here to support. Um, artists from international, from national, and from um, regional as well. So where we're at right now, I'm actually going to stop this part of the presentation because I know I'm out of time, um, is that we, now that we have done the first work um, on a curatorial assessment of the collection to look at what we have and really contextualize what we have, because a lot of municipal public art collections are not created with a curatorial angle to them. Um, you have discrete pieces scattered around the city without much that ties them together other than the fact that they're owned by the city. Um, so now that we've done a curatorial assessment, we're starting to pull things together to contextualize and actually start to develop a collection strategy of how we want to go forward into the future, um, working with emerging artists, working with local artists, regional, international representation. Um, and how we also want to branch out into high risk projects from a technology standpoint, a material standpoint, as well as temporary um, opportunities as well, because I think that's where, um, like Chloe had said, there is a lot of opportunity to really open things up. So I'm going to stop there. I've actually got about 500 more slides to go, um, but um, I'll hand it back over to Crystal because I know that we've got lots to cover and I might be able to pull back in a couple examples of um, some of the other projects that we've been working on as well. Thank you. Wonderful. 
Okay, thank you so much, David, for walking us through some of those projects and, um, and giving us a sense of the priorities and, and um, the strategy developed uh, by Edmonton. I, I had a chance to look through some of those images, or at least images um, on uh, the council's website and was struck by just how dynamic um, uh, the examples of public art present themselves on screen. I mean, there's uh, an incredible use of color in a lot of those works, um, a myriad approaches to materials. And at first blush, I looked through those thinking, wow, this is not what, um, what many kind of portfolios of public art can look like for a city. So I, I'm just curious um, to know, and this is where I, I'll start some of the questions and not really with, um, with all of the questions I outlined earlier, mm -hmm. but I'm curious to know um, what, kind, what has that transition looked like for you? Has it, has it been noticeable? Did it start before 2008 or is it really in 2008 when uh, the master plan was revised that you started to see those changes happen? Yeah, I mean, I, so I came on in, like I said, in 2009. Um, and, oh, my alarm just keeps going off. I don't know why. It keeps reminding me that I'm long in the <laughs> tongue. Um, anyways, uh, yeah, I, I, so I came on in 2009. Um, I was aware because I'm, I'm you know, my family uh, moved to Edmonton in the 80s. And at the time, when the program really started going, I was I was working in Denver at the Art Museum there, working with their modern and contemporary collection. Um, so I was aware that there were changes that were starting to happen. And as a practicing artist, before I left Edmonton, I was also aware of where what some of those earlier opportunities were in the late 1990s, early 2000s, because I had even applied for some of those. And I think that some of the result of um, what came out of a lot of those earlier calls were what we would all consider to be fairly traditional public art, mm -hmm. bronzes, um, painted metals, um, you know, fairly large, somewhat abstract, but also fairly accessible um, from, a, from that public interface point of view. Um, and really when, I think that for, for Edmonton, it really was when Talus Dome happened in 2011 or so, um, that's kind of when, I mean, it really is this giant stainless steel, not too dissimilar from Cloudgate, not nearly the size, but really kind of, um, spiked that football down in the ground and just said, public art is here. This is what public art is going to be from now on. It's going to be in your face. It's going to be um, difficult to ignore. It's going to take some chances, not just material wise, but in, where and how we position it within the public realm in a non-passive way. And I think that that really was a big turning point um, for how we approached building the collection. Mm -hmm. Because we really wanted public art to be visible, we wanted it to be seen, we wanted it to be impactful. And as a result, um, that kind of approach actually drew in a lot of artists, especially international artists that we had never seen apply for anything before. Um, and our public art director at the time really had, a, had her finger on the pulse of who was doing what around the world um, yeah. and, and how to start pulling that into, into a city like Edmonton. That's good to know. Um, you mentioned Cloudgate, and I, I I know that Chloe knows a bit more about that project, and I'd, I'd like to bring that into our conversation. So, you know, di discussions about how public art can have a magnetic effect on a collective audience, whether that be the community that it's that is host to the work, or the tourists who make the pilgrimage to see the work, and and this is where you know we might think of Anish Kapoor's Cloudgate in Chicago. Um, Chloe, I wonder, given your experience managing the public commissions for Chicago's Millennium Park, which is where Cloudgate is housed, um, has that work transformed how you approach commissions? And if so, how? Um, yeah, I mean, just to be clear, I wasn't, I wasn't managing the whole of uh, Millennium Park. I just, <laughs> I, I worked, I collaborated with them on, on one particular project. I mean, it was, okay. it was a really big project, but I didn't manage their whole, their whole roster. But, um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, when people think of Millennium Park, they immediately think of Cloudgate, um, and which is, it's, it's, you know, that's just normal. Um, but it's important to remember that there are also other works there. You know, yes. um, I think there's, you know, there's Crown Fountain by Plenza, which is, you know, just as incredible, um, you know, um, there's, and, but there's also the Boeing galleries, 
that have rotating temporary pieces and that's um, that that's the area that I worked on for a few years um, because I was I, I was sort of helping them on um, you know a commission for sort of six uh, temporary pieces for those galleries now um, even though they were large scale and up for you know one and a half years or so um, it was still a huge project um, but really I mean just like any other uh, public art project you know I learned really valuable lessons about fabrication about shipping um, you know, I was working with an artist from Mexico, so I had to, um, but I was working here in Toronto. So it was a case of administering, you know, um, something that was happening from in Mexico and, and, and or that was being built in Mexico and, 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 then, and then shipping it to, to the States. Um, and, you know, and all sorts of things about, you know, maintenance, you know, how do you, how do you balance wanting people to interact with these sculptures and educating hordes of school children not to climb up them and grind the gravel into the, into the, you know, into the surface. So all of those lessons I take into, you know, all of the, all the, the, the commissions that I, that I work on, whether, whether it's, you know, multi-million dollar art piece or whether it's, you know, something that's, you know, $10,000 worth it. I, you know, it's, it's all, they're, it's all, they're all lessons. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, you know, I mean, a lot of us in public art are, are looking kind of beyond the massive kind of sculpture on a plinth. Um, to works that are more subtle and community engaged um, or ephemeral and, and and I really think that there's room for everything um, you know if it's done well um, so you know the incredible thing about Clyde Cloudgate and Crown Fountain is that they're very engaging um, you see yourself reflected you play in their waters they have a sort of very dynamic relationship with the built environment um, around them and, and and therefore they're constantly changing mm -hmm. so um, I'm I have a question for David that uh, uh, I think ties well is tied to some of the some of what you touched on in your presentation um, and seeing images of the uh, indigenous sculpture part. So, like many municipalities, Edmonton's public art collection is a combination of works that were purchased or acquired to beautify public space and work that. Uh, was commissioned to animate spaces with very specific functions and histories. Some of the successes that I see in Edmonton's program include the increasing presence of mid-career artists and the recently completed uh, Indigenous Sculpture Park is a good example of that. What exciting changes have you witnessed in how the public engages with these new projects? And can you tell us a little bit more about the evolution of that particular sculpture park? Sure. Um... So I think I'm sharing my screen. I think I did that kind of prematurely. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so the the in Inu River Lot 11 um, is what we is the official title for what we call the Indigenous Art Park here in Edmonton. This was a project that unfolded over the course of um, depending on who you talk to, five years, seven years, six years. Um, it was a fairly lengthy process. This was a this is a park where. Um, you know, it actually set a lot of precedents for how we operate and how we think now. Um, this is a park that came about because the, the park was under redevelopment. The original public art master plan um, had called for a series of, or, or a network of art parks throughout the Edmonton River Valley. I mean, Edmonton is loved for its river valley and its network of trails and connections and bridges and natural spaces. Um, but it's also an area which is extremely, extremely significant um, to the Indigenous people of the area. Um, and specifically this area where the Indigenous Art Park lies, because it's, uh, it, was an, it was a gathering space for a number of various bands um, and families to, to come together to trade, to partner, to um, share stories um and 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 check on everyone i mean it really was a gathering space and so the the park itself would not have contributed very much uh, significantly in, in dollars at all um we were able to actually uh, work with the within the constraints of the public art policy at the time to reallocate funds from another larger composite project to fund this um, and so that's also set precedence for how we approach some of our larger composite projects now and how we start thinking about public art planning around the city and ultimately how we think about redefining the public art policy um, completely. So, so I mean, this, this park is important for so many reasons. Um, 
you know, not just because of the art and the place that it holds. Um, a lot of the artists at the time, um, so, so we, we broke this into categories. We, had, we worked with a curator for the first time. So we brought on Candace Hopkins, um, who was phenomenal to work with over the number of years, because when you go through this space, we have six artists um, represented here. Um, they worked with local communities. They learned from local elders. Um, they really, you know, and, and uh, only one of the artists is actually from this place, um, but, or, or, and still resides in the city. Um, but really it was about, you know, the importance of this place is not just to make it an important place just for the Indigenous populations. It really was to represent that this is a gathering space and the importance of bringing others into that space. So when we look at the history of other public art projects in the city like Talus Dome, where one of the most contentious aspects of it wasn't just that it was a pile of shiny balls next to the highway, um, is that it cost $600,000 and it was, low, it was uh, commissioned to a couple artists in Los Angeles. They weren't local. To me, this is, a, this is a perfect example of why it's important to actually reach beyond your boundaries to bring ideas into um, how they reflect the space, how they experience your spaces that you see every day. Um, but it's also important to bring those artists that are from here together with those other artists. So a lot of these principles, a lot of these values that this, this art park really demonstrated through the five to seven year span that it occupied to realize really is the basis for how we are thinking around public art through every, everything that we're doing going forward now. So we have, um, at the time we had a couple uh, emerging artists. So we had Amy Malbuff, whose syllabics are represented here, um, and Tiffany Shaw College. Um, we had two mid-career artists. Um, one was Jerry Whitehead, who was originally from uh, Saskatchewan, and Dwayne Linklater, who's from Ontario. And then two established artists, one is Marianne Barkhouse, and you can see her piece on the, on the plinth in, in the background there. And Marianne Nicholson, uh, who's now based out of Victoria. Here's Marianne Barkhouse's piece. Uh, Dwayne Linklater's is on the left there. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of breaking this into emerging mid-career and established artists was a little weird. Um, it was mostly done for budgetary purposes. Um, and from the outside, it's, it seems to make sense. But once you're actually in the process, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And the reason is, is because when you take these emerging artists, such as Amy Malbuff and Tiffany Shaw Collins, whose piece is here on the left, um, this kind of land art piece, um, they really were, they, they didn't have experience working in public art before. So when you put us emerging artists with a small budget who are wanting to represent themselves in the same league as established artists who fully understand what the scope of what they can do and what their budget can allow for, they, I feel like they really overshot. And I mean, it, it took a lot of work to ensure that they didn't lose money on it. Because that's the one thing we never want to see is artists actually losing money on a project. So we had to look for different ways that we could support them and find efficiencies within the project. As of, co of course, as this went along, these two artists are, you know, mid-career to established artists at this point. Um, Dwayne and Jerry are definitely no longer um, mid-career artists. They're, they're, I mean, these are significant artists within the country, right? Jerry's um, turtles are there in the background. So I think that kind of answer, answers your question, uh, Crystal. Yeah. I mean, it really did set a lot of precedent for how we work with artists, how we support them, and that realization of, you know, um, artists are capable of different things and there are different levels of support where you need to come in. Um, but also this was a way, this was our precedent to really just take the policy and just mm -hmm. blow it out of the water. Right? Yeah, I appreciate that, uh, that backstory. It, it definitely changes and I think maybe um, amplifies the value that I, I had attributed to that project without even actually experiencing it firsthand. Mm -hmm. Now I have to go back to Edmonton to see. <laughs> um, and I think what you mentioned is something that I'd love to have Chloe's insight on too. You, you touched on um, mid-career, uh, early career um, 
senior or established artists. And, and I think for, um, for those of us who've been part of juries, we know we often see a sort of usual suspects paraded out for, uh, for certain um, RFQs. And I, it, it can be kind of hard for folks who are just trying to get their foot in the door and get that first, uh, that first project. They may not have a solid base of subcontracting con, uh, contacts. They, they, may, they may just really be starting out, but there's so much promise in what they've been able to do with the studio. And, and yet, you know, their com concepts that might be bringing forth or could potentially be more compelling than those being brought forward by the folks who, who know their materials in and out and know the process like the back of their hand. So I'm wondering, um, and, and maybe I'll direct this to you, Chloe, um, what, what thoughts you may be willing to share on key ways that artists can prepare for that transition of making the work in the studio um, to working specifically for a public space? Yeah, it's super important because because we all we all um, ask ourselves these questions, and I and I can I can give some some kind of concrete advice because I've you know I've actually worked on projects uh, with you know. Um, or, or, you know, have just sort of awarded projects to artists who um, haven't really done much public art, you know. So I think, I think the key is, um, you know, number one, do a, make a really strong proposal. Um, and, you know, because the thing about, uh, you know, artists who, who have done a lot of public art is that they're really adept at like doing good proposals because they know, they know how to do it. Um, so I, you know, it's, it's, it just always bears saying because I cannot tell you how many times I come across this, and I'm sure David has too, is that, you know, everyone has to send in what's required. Um, we get a ton of submissions and even, even artists who have done a lot of submissions tend to, you know, just if, if what is asked for is send everything in one PDF or if it's what is asked for is send 10, just 10, minute, 10 images, it, that's what you have to do. So, it, because it just, if you don't, it looks really unprofessional. And in fact, you're, you're pretty much disqualified right from the start. So, you know, do a really, really strong proposal. Um, get some great images of your work, of your previous work. So studio work, whatever you've got, get some really, really good professional photographs done. Um, that really matters. Um, and you know, in, in, a, in your statement, maybe, you know, um, explain how your studio work could translate into art in the public realm. Um, you know, write a really inspiring statement that'll get the jury excited, um, but also be practical. So, you know, perhaps, you know, a really good idea is speaking to artists who have done public art and ask them really practical questions. You know, artists will always help each other out in general. So, you know, grab the phone, talk to you know, an artist who has done lots of projects and really just ask them all sorts of uh, uh, questions um, that'll help with your proposal. Um, you know, um, specifically, you know, um, fabrication, installation and budget too. Ask them about how to do a budget or how much things cost in, in a bit ballpark. Um, another good, good sort of um, advice is, piece of advice is collaborate maybe with a good fabrication studio um, so that juries can rest assured that there's really good experience behind it. I mean, we have just awarded um, a, 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 a quite an important temporary art piece to an artist who hasn't really done much work in the public realm. And this artist had, had teamed up with a really good fabrication studio. And so that gave the, the jury kind of, you know, um, the sort of, the, 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 the I don't know, uh, the, 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 uh, Felt they made it made them feel feel at ease that this, this this could actually be done you know um, on time and on budget, um, you know. Uh, let's not forget that public art you know requires expertise and you know it's technically difficult. Um, if it's not you know engineered properly, it can fall on someone, and no one would want that. So you know we can't cast that aside. I mean, and just lastly, also you know think about partnering with you know an experienced artist to make a team. You know, I love seeing collaborations and teams of artists, you know, some can be, you know, as I say, you can always team up with someone who's had more experience. Um, the city of Toronto does a lot of mentorships for their large public art pro um, projects, um, but also, you know, find smaller projects, art, uh, projects to start with, like, you know, temporary art pieces or the artists in residence. And that will give, you know, artists, um, you know, experience on smaller projects and then they can slowly, you know, build to the larger ones. So, 
um, yeah, that's that's some some advice that I would give. Okay. Yeah. Um, David, do you have anything to add to that? Any any insights from your vantage point? Uh, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I love um, public art that takes risks. Um, and so maybe I'm not the most responsible or best person to be heading a program. We need people <laughs> that, like you. <laughs> that, 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 that's really, uh, you know, bent on, on confidence. Um, but that said, I mean, there, there's responsible, there's responsibility within it, right? I mean, we're, we as the commissioning agents, the, the artists, the fabricators, they're all responsible for making this stuff work. Um, but I really think that if there is a push from the municipality to invest in that capacity building for um, up and coming artists looking to move into the public art realm, I mean, it's, it's the public art, it, dis, the discipline of public art is not the same as studio art where you take your art and you just put it out in a public space. Um, I think there is a, there needs to be some more work done around communicating what public art really is and what public art means to different cities. They're all going to have a very different definition and different approach to it. Um, for us, um, I mean, we, if, you know, we're, we're always looking at ways that we can kind of shake things up and open it up so that, you know, studio artists can get their stuff out into public spaces. So if we're looking at, you know, uh, uh, art parks where we can do loan programs and bring artists on and, and use their work for a few years. We can actually work with those artists as well on the care and maintenance of their stuff in real time through real exposure in this climate, uh, which I really appreciate. Um, but I think also, you know, the, the, the practice of doing public art when we're looking at um, what it means to do art in the public realm to respond to its environment, for the environment to respond to it, and for the different type of interaction that you might get from it, than for a studio-based artist or a gallery artist, it, it is very different. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely there's project management skills because it really is managing that project um, because you need to somehow get it done and get it in the ground as best as you can. Um, and I think having that support network of, you know, people who are willing to help you out. And I mean, I, I think if you can find a conservator who's interested in materials, who wants to work through some challenges and some ideas, um, that's pretty cool. Um, I, from my conservation training, I've always got to give a shout out to conservators. We, we're not all risk adverse. Most of us are. But once in a while, we, we give the nod to a giant neon <laughs> because why not <laughs> the unsung heroes of our profession <laughs> well, I, I think I that there is there's that material science <laughs> yeah. thing right and and it's yeah. not something that all fabricators are aware of either um but it is a it's a growing field in the conservation field is modern materials and public art materials as well that's a great a great tip for folks who are thinking about different avenues into which um one might work in in the arts. So there's a there's a number of great questions that are coming through the chat and I'd like to share them uh, with you both now and so you've touched on some of the topics that are coming out through uh, through the chat. So I may uh, I may modify some of the questions. My apologies to um, to the wonderful insightful folks who've shared the questions. Um, but we have one question here that um, that asks are all public art projects framed as competitions? Have either of you worked with artists in other ways, for example, in a mentorship long term relationship model um, and the ask the asker of the question um, provides that or states that they ask because RFQs can be daunting and, and we both we've all spoken of that. Um, and for many folks who are working in a solo capacity that that may be quite a challenge. So I'm wondering if you two could talk a little bit about how mentorship might unfold in your respective um, positions. David, do you want to start? Or I mean, I'm, I'm, trying, to think, I'm trying to think yeah, of, of all it. the, yeah, I'm trying to think of all the projects that I've done. Um, I mean, particularly in a municipal context. I mean, the thing about working in a municipality is that, you know, the the, the dollars are sort of tied up. There's public money, and so 
um, you know, there's there's a, there's an there's an issue around sort of fairness, if you like, and that we have to give everyone, you know, a chance. And you and 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 so, you know, the point about putting out these open calls is that anyone conceivably could, you know, could could apply. I mean. You know, as you said, the, 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 you know, some of the problems around that is that it becomes, you know, the same people that apply. But, you know, hopefully we, we are thinking of um, different kinds of projects. I mean, like, you know, the, the, my artist in residence, you know, is very much a different kind of call uh, for more community engaged art and, um, you know, um, and, and a sort of, you know, really the idea of sort of thinking about, you know, the, the, the residency being not so much about the product, but uh, around um, process and thinking, really, you know, thinking about new ways of engaging the public and using our public spaces, especially after COVID. Um, so the residency just becomes a different thing. Um, and it's a much longer period where, you know, we can work with the artists and where they can expand their practice. And, um, but it, it's still an open competition, um, you know, uh, uh, um, there are a few instances when I suppose, you know, when it's, a, I mean, I, I, when I used to work in Mississauga, I mean, I think if it was anything under $10,000, um, you know, could go, we could do a, pro, we could do a sort of a direct commission, mm -hmm. you know, if it was a sort of deemed a small amount like that. Um, so, you know, I did, I did do a couple of those that were just directly commissioned, especially if it's a sort of temporary piece that needs to, you know, it needs to get going fast and there's no time to do this sort of long process of open calls. Um, so, so, but I mean, usually, as I say, it just depends where the funding comes from. Um, but I mean, I think in uh, probably the same for David, if it's in, if it's in a municipal context, context, we, we usually have to do these open calls and, and, and I think it's just really important that people, you know, don't look at RFQs as something very daunting. I mean, RFQs has been particular, you know, refer, requests for qualifications are you know, a short artist statement and your qualifications um, and some images. It's not, it's not a full blown proposal. Um, and I think that, you know, if you do it really carefully and well and really talk to other artists who have done it, I think it's, it's possible to, 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 to just um, to, to do it well and, and just keep on sending them out. You know, I mean, I, I, I have definitely awarded, um, you know, uh, some projects to artists who have not worked in the public realm before, you know, and so it's, it's, you know, just, I think you just have to keep on doing it and get get better at doing it and not feel daunted about it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and and I think that that's why, you know, we so um, we try and look for for all these different opportunities to try and mentor artists and get get emerging artists in the door, um, give them that, those opportunities. So I mean, we do do quite a bit of transitory or temporary programming um, that's outside of the percent for art. So like the art loans. Um, that are studio based. Um, we do some temporary, um, you know, billboard and LRT and bus projects, uh, vinyl wrap projects, things like that, where, you know, it gives those artists that opportunity to get something out there into the public realm uh, without having to worry about the permanence or any of those responsibilities or constraints of materials. It really just frees them up. Um, and we're always looking for opportunities where we can you know, informally pair artists up, um, not with, uh, not necessarily as a formal mentorship, but if you just bring artists together, um, what kind of things can happen? So with our, um, our latest round of calls, we had a, a series of calls for the new LRT line that we're developing in the city. We had two calls that were for design only for artists, for local artists only. Um, and then we had two integrated larger commissions um, that went to regional and national artists. And what we've started doing and experimenting with is in trying to figure out how we support those artists, but also looking for ways that the mentees can also offer some support to the mentors um, right. to make it that reciprocal um, relationship is, you know, get those artists together in a room with a facilitator or with a curator in this case, so that they can each learn about what one another's practice are, what mm. one another's histories are. Um, they're four artists who don't know each other um, yeah. and all at different stages of their career. So we're kind of doing this as a little bit of a lab experiment to see just what the potential is. And if we can kind of let them guide us where they need that support and then for us to learn from them 
about what kind of changes we might need to make and what other kind of opportunities would be positive for the artists as well. But for the most part, I mean, we try and keep our RFQs as simple as possible because we want to give artists that equal fair uh, potential to represent themselves and present their portfolios to a committee themselves without just being judged on the quality of the images, their CV, how much experience they have, all of that. I mean, the, the committee is really charged with looking for the possibilities and the potential in, in these artists. So just to piggyback what you said there a moment ago, Stephen, we have one question about um, framing uh, your RFP or RFQ. If in the past you've worked collaboratively, but you're trying to branch out and develop a bit of a solo, um, a solo practice in this, in this area, can you provide any suggestions on how to frame one's experience? Is it, is it okay to just include your collaborative work and, and the successes that have happened under that, that framework? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and I encourage artists to do that. But I think that the, what has to happen, and this is what I see in a lot of committee meetings, is, is the committee members question what level of involvement each artist had. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's really important to discuss. I mean, if you're uh, partnering with a fabricator, is that fabricator a collaborator or a creative partner, or are they just a fabricator? Um, if you're partnering with other artists, what does that relationship look like? Um, because I think in order to, to be able to show, you have to show the committee where your strengths are, what your level of involvement was. And I think you also be able, have to be able to show them what, what you've benefited or what you've gained out of that partnership, right? Um, I'm always looking for the potentials and failures of, you know, what have you learned? <laughs> How do we build on this? Okay, let's, let's do this a different way next time. And maybe let's not try and let's not screw up quite as much. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, how do you, how do you build? But I think that that's where it's that uh, transparency on, on what your involvement was. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we have another question about um, online resources and finding where one might be able to locate some, um, some award winning or even just an example of a winning uh, RFQ or an RFP, or I guess a number of, of um, artists will include RFPs or renderings for projects that haven't necessarily been awarded, but were um, proposed. Do you, either of you, have any suggestions on where um, uh, folks who are wanting to get into public art may look for examples of, of um, exemplary uh, proposals? Yeah, I think, um I'm not sure if they put actual proposals in there, but I, I always find that, um, I think it's called the Americans for the Arts. Um, they have a really, really good uh, website and they give all sorts of really great, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of advice and examples on their website. So I would, I would, I would look at that. Um, it's, it's hard, I mean, I, I, I couldn't, I don't think I'm actually allowed to share any 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 sort of anyone's RFQ is like I mean I think that would just be sort of be a breach of of, of um, you know of I don't know like I just I don't think I have information so um, but I think you know I think a few of us are always I mean I think people do workshops you know um, yes. and, and I think that you know the city of Mississauga did a really good workshop recently um, on proposals really really nuts and bolts um, and I'm not sure if it's it might well be up on their website. Um, I would I would have a look on the city of Mississauga's website because they did a really really good practical, uh, you know, talk and workshop on just on on proposals um, and what you know the anatomy of it and how to how to do them well and and gave and did give kind of examples. I mean, not of particular proposals, but you know what constitutes a sort of a, a, a well framed image and not, not you know all those kind of things. Um, so I would look on their website and if you can't find it, you know, write to them and, and ask them if they can post it. Um, but, you know, and the city of Toronto is always, you know, is planning things. And, and I think during, especially during the year of public art next year, there's gonna be all sorts of, there's gonna be all sorts of workshops and, and lectures and talks and, you know, uh, about public art. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't, can you think of any other kind of online sources for, for this, David? Yeah, um, you know, I, 
I'm a big fan of just reaching out to artists. I'm a, yeah, and I'm a big too. fan of reaching out to the administrators that, that administrate yeah. the programs. Um, I agree. Yeah, we can't share the, mm -hmm. the actual winning um, package, the submission package. But, you know, there, it, it's not just the RFP package. It's, it's, it's what happens after. These are, these are two-stage processes, right? So that's just to get you shortlisted. It's what happens after you're shortlisted is really the meat of it. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I have no problem um, being approached by artists to take a look at a submission package, to take a look at a portfolio, to say, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? Um, I think there's other artists out there to use as resources. And I, and I would even go through your own municipality and their collections and find out, you know, if there's if there's local artists that have won commissions or that have representation yeah. in that city, I would just give them a call and buy them a coffee and absolutely and absolutely. and ask them to look at their to either look at your proposal or look at theirs for tips yeah. right like yeah I think that's the yeah. absolute best way to to get that because it's not I just agree there. Them. I agree it's also I mean, getting that feedback right yeah I mean that's you yeah. know look for your own mentorships and I know and I know for sure some artists who have, who have done that, who have really, really struck up a really great relationship with, you know, other artists, I mean, and, and um, you know, and got a sort of mentorship out of it. But, uh, and I'm sure it's like, it's like asking someone, you know, how did you get that job? Um, and, and most people will say, sure, you know, let's, let's talk about it and give them all sorts of practical advice. Yeah. So definitely use artists, other artists who have won competitions and done all sorts of work, you know, just uh, go out and ask them. I'm mm -hmm. sure that, yeah. Yeah. And I think go back to the administrators too. And you can ask for jury comments. You can ask for um, committee comments. You can ask for feedback. I mean, and, and we, we try and offer as much as we can, um, you know, and, and we set that stage at the, it, within the, the selection committee uh, meeting is that this has to be constructive and we want to be able to offer constructive feedback to the artists. So, and that really changes the tone. If you've ever been part of any selection committees, they can, you know, be really, they can go all different directions, right? But in the end, I mean, if we're looking for constructive feedback to really serve artists, to help them build their careers, um, we wanted to make, make it as constructive as possible. Mm -hmm. I might also suggest that um, a great resource is, that can be found online is the Public Art Toolkit. It was produced as part of the Creative Cities Canada Network of Canada, uh, published in 2010. There's great, um, great information in that document, resources, and it was prepared by uh, a number of curators who were working in Vancouver. And of course, we know Vancouver has quite a robust uh, public art program as well. So if anyone is looking for that, you can find that on Creative Cities. .ca, um, and just do a search for public art tool, a toolkit, excuse me, and, um, and you should be able to pull it up. Um, I'm just going to see if there's a last question. Okay. Can you give uh, advice on how artists should work on their budget? Anything they should watch out from from the start, uh, etc.? Mm -hmm. Inflation. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Inflation. Inflation. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Public health concerns. <laughs> well, health I mean, concern? look. Yeah, go ahead. Budget, go ahead. again, I mean, I, this is, um, you know, uh, uh, I think in Mississauga, in that workshop, they gave a very good breakdown of what your budget should compose of. But, um, you know, just sort of looking at best practice around, you know, around what percentage should be, you know, your, um, the, the, the artist, um, sort of the artist fee, you know, you know, I would say don't, don't, don't don't set you know don't put, put put aside too little or too much for the artist fee because I think that's gonna you know I mean if you if if if, if the jury says you know sees that an artist has just given themselves you know five percent artist fee then they're gonna say well you know I, they need more money or you know they should they should put more money towards or if they they're putting you know seventy percent towards their artist fee and thirty percent towards the art then that's also going to be a problem so it needs to be a little bit you know I'd say like a twenty percent kind of you know twenty eighty mm -hmm. or something like that but or twenty five eighty something like that but you know also contingency you know uh, that's something that most a uh, lot of artists don't don't put in there and it's just really important it's really really important to put a contingency in there a ten percent contingency or whatever um, you know and I think and just do some homework you know ask fabricators or ask what you want know, to like give them a ballpark figure so you can put it in there so don't just kind of like pull numbers from 
you know, from anywhere, just, mm -hmm. I, you know, do the homework and ask around, ask, ask the actual, you know, fabricators or installers around how much something costs. So, yeah, but I would say contingency and artistry are some things that I sometimes feel are a little off balance. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that the, you know, there's, there's a tendency to underestimate things like engineering and where you may yeah. need additional assistance from other professionals. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, but I do think that, you know, if, if depending on how long your project is planned for, so if you're applying now um, and a project, like, I mean, we have, we have calls that we're putting out now, but we know that the, like the LRT line isn't going to be open for seven years. Um, and if the artworks, if the artists are selected now, how do they, you know, they're, they're projecting what the cost of things are going to be um, in five to six years once they enter fabrication. And in some cases, I mean, with what's going on, like with aluminum right now, those costs can just skyrocket and they can to completely break the bank. So I think not only is it the contingency, but it's all, or your contingency, yeah. but it's also, it's, it's the projection of, and protecting yourself against what you have no idea that you don't know about yet. Mm -hmm. which I have no idea how you do that. Um, can't see into the future, but, but yeah, you really, I think that's one of the riskiest things is that when a project really stretches, that's where you really need to do your due diligence when you're working through your contract, your yeah. contract with your service providers and your contract with your commissioning agent. Yeah. Um, because unfortunately with the majority of capital projects, um, the public art is, um, is 1%. And what an artist gets paid from that 1% is, you know, 15 to 20%. So it's a very, very small amount that the artist is actually making. And therefore, yeah. the risk is quite high yeah. uh, for what they're expected to deliver. Um, so I think yeah. that's, that's probably the, the only advice that I can give is, I mean, you really need to know what you're responsible for and what others are responsible for. You're right. Build, build in cushioning because it's always going to, all things are always going to come up and none of us want them to want, want, want that to be, you know, coming, coming out of, of an artist fee. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Contingency. Very important. David and Chloe, thank you so much for your time this afternoon and for the wonderful conversation. Um, there were so many questions that came through the Q&A and I haven't been able to forward all of those your way, but don't be surprised if, um, if folks start contacting you <laughs> with more oh, of those yeah. in the future. Um, and I think I'm going to hand it off to Jan, who's going to close things up for the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks. Oh, maybe it's, it's Rebecca. Not yet. It's Rebecca. <laughs> Sorry, Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to um, start my closing by thanking uh, everyone who's joined us today. We've had uh, well over 100 people from uh, all over the globe tuning in to, um, to listen to what you've had to say, which is so exciting. And of course, um, right after that, I want to thank the three of you for a really, really dynamic conversation that um, may, may found that perfect medium between very practical and a little provocative as well, which has been, um, been really interesting, even for those of us who have been working in this field for a very long time. Um, so I hope it was inform informative to uh, people and kind of tantalizing for people who joined in. Uh, I loved uh, a few things that, um, in particular, a couple of things David said about public art not being uh, just the same as taking a studio practice and putting it in public space, and that there's this whole kind of experimental leap that happens when you put something out there and see what happens. Um, and uh, there's so many parameters and sort of safety issues in terms of uh, physicality and materiality and finances and all that sort of stuff. It's really uh, heartening to have people like you discussing these projects, uh, this panel, and, uh, and self-identifying as risk takers because um, it would be horrible to think that we were just being safe on all fronts. And to close, just to, to mention again one thing that David said, every city has their piece that everyone hates or loves to hate or comes to love. And I think as long as we don't try and please everybody all the time, <laughs> we'll continue um, you know, as an industry, keeping people talking about art in the public realm, which is, um, which is really important. So um, we have one more of these webinars coming up on Friday, same time, same place, which is 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. 
Um, and that is on materiality and fabrication. It's a conversation between uh, Canadian artist Mathanley McLeod and conservator Catherine Machado, um, moderated uh, by artist Jason Lujan. And uh, once again, this series is co-produced by Varley Art Gallery and City of Markham Public Art Program. And really that is the hard work of Yan Wu and Anique Lode, and they've been a pleasure to work with, as has everybody on the panel. Thank you very much for joining us and hope to see you on Friday. Bye-bye.